So when I was 18, <clears throat> I was working in a movie theater. I worked at this movie theater with a handful of friends. And there was a New Year's Eve party. New Year's Eve 2000, December 2000 going into 2001. So I'm at this party and, uh, you know, there's coworkers, there's people who, who currently work at the movie theater, who worked there in the past, friends of friends. Uh, my sister was there, you know, just, uh, I don't know, probably 15 or 20 people and I'm 18 years old. And, uh, and they were making this drink called Alien Orgasms. I actually love them. Uh, I don't anymore. But back when I was eighteen, of course I loved them. They were they were sweet. They were like a they were like a treat. They were like dessert. They were like I don't know, coconut rum or something like that, and some sort of vodka and I don't know something else was in there. Something's in an Alien Orgasm, and then pineapple orange juice and maybe some grenadine, something like that. And and it looked green. It was a green drink. So. It's a lot of alcohol in one drink, and uh, and so I think I probably had four or five of them over the course of two or three, or maybe four hours. So I'm 18 years old. I'm a little over 18 at this time. I've never had sex before in my life, and it's my first New Year's Eve party too, like a legit actual party, house party type of thing. And uh, and so there's this former worker from the movie theater, this blonde girl. She's cute. And then there's a current worker that I worked with. Don't remember her name. Um, probably blocked it out of my memory. Blocked most of that night out of my memory. But there's a few things that I remember that I'm going to share with you. Um, so this girl, her, uh, she's she's a lesbian, uh, first of all. And when I say lesbian, not like a cute lesbian. Uh, she was probably all of, she looked like a boy. She was probably all of about five foot two. And uh, short, short, short hair. I mean, just, I mean, you know, probably two inches of, of hair on her head. Glasses, just not an attractive person at all. Certainly not my type. Maybe attractive to someone, but not my type. So, ball drops at midnight. And, uh, and I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes before the ball drops, I'm hearing, like, you're supposed to kiss someone when the ball drops. I've never heard this before. So, uh, ball drops. And, and I really want to kiss Blondie. Uh, instead, super drunk me and super drunk lesbian girl, lesbian girl starts making out with me. She's a full-on lesbian and starts making out with me. And uh, everyone's confused, everyone including myself. And I'm like, I don't want this. Stop. I don't want this. And over the course of the next 90 minutes, maybe two hours, she, this girl chases me around the fucking house. She wants to fuck me. And, and I've never had sex before and I don't want it. I've, I'm, I like, this is not how I ever envisioned, uh, my first time having sex was, was drunk at a fucking house party with a lesbian that I'm not attracted to in the least bit. Uh, she literally chased me into a bathroom and locked the door behind her. And there's people knocking on the door because they want to see everything that's about to happen. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm like, can you get the fuck out of here? Can you get the fuck out of the bathroom? And, uh, and I get out of the bathroom and I go downstairs to the other bathroom and where all of the alien orgasms are now going to, uh, come back up. They've decided they don't want to be inside me anymore. So I go into the downstairs bathroom and I thought I locked the door behind me. Maybe I didn't, but, uh, I get on the floor and just immediately fucking all of those alien orgasms. I throw them all up. Um, and I'm laying on the floor. There's fucking nachos and, and green alcohol inside of this fucking toilet. And, uh, and I'm, you know, doing the thing that you do when you're throwing up, when you're 18 years old and drunk, uh, you know, I'm sitting on the floor, pretty much hugging the toilet and somehow lesbian gets the, uh, gets the door open and, um, and she looks in and she goes, what are you doing? which I thought was an interesting question. It seems pretty obvious to me what I'm doing. And then she gets on the floor and starts making out with me. And I was like, oh, God damn it. Like, I mean, you know, that was the only thought going through my head. Like, if I just open the door and someone's throwing up, putting my tongue in their mouth is not uh, top of my list of things that I want to do. So, you know, I continue to just try and fucking hide from this girl. Try and get away from her. And, and try and drive it into her head that I want nothing to do with her. And uh, she's she's not hearing me 
in, in any way. And uh, it's about 2 a.m. People start, you know, either leaving or going to bed. People are falling asleep all over the place, including myself. I was, I couldn't fucking stand up anymore. Couldn't hold my eyes open. I got under the dining room table thinking, here's a safe spot away from this lesbian. Here's a safe place. I can get under here and fall asleep. Nope. She, uh, she finds me. She crawls under there and then she fucks me. And, uh, I mean, I probably woke up two, three, four hours later and she's gone. Um, she's long gone. And, uh, that is the definition of rape. Um, you know, maybe in well, New Hampshire, I think we'd call it sexual assault, but common, the common word is, uh, is certainly rape. And, uh, so that was my introduction to, to, uh, to having sex in the first place was a lesbian chasing me around a house while I repeatedly told her no. And, uh, and then she fucked me. And, um, and then, you know, a couple days goes by. I mean, fucking people from the, from the movie theater, I didn't see her again. I never saw her again after that. Um, but, uh, cause I quit the movie theater shortly after, like within a week or two, I quit the movie theater. I, I think that I had shifts that I just didn't show up for. And I eventually called the manager there and I was like, I'm not, I'm not coming back to work. And she's trying to talk to me. She's like, you got to talk to her. And, you know, I got friends that are talking to me and they're like, you know, she's not on the pill. And, you know, she, you know, she's confused because she's, you know, she's been a lesbian for however fucking long she's been a lesbian. I mean, it had been years. It had been three or four years. <laughs> that was cool. For those of you not watching the live video, my, uh, my lighting system just crashed on my head. Maybe it's just a sign from the heavens to shut the fuck up. I gotta figure out something better here, I'm sure. Because really my lights are just sitting on top of a cardboard box. And that'll have to do for now. Anyways, so so this girl. Uh, you know, people are people are talking to me, telling me, Oh, you gotta you gotta fucking talk to her. And I don't wanna talk to her. I have no interest in ever seeing her again. And like I said, I never saw her again after that night. So my friend uh, he was my best friend at the shame, uh, at the time, rather. <laughs> he was my best friend at the time. Uh, his name was Shane. And uh, he, um, you know, we hung out all the time. We used to go to movies together and, uh, you know, go out, go out to dinner. I was under 21, so we didn't go out for drinks or anything. Plus, he was sober. So uh, Shane, I, I can't remember if I said his name, but sh me and Shane, we hung out all the time. So... We're hanging out one night, and it's a fucking snowstorm. I mean, this was back in 2000, when 2001, when we actually got goddamn snow up here. So, uh, me and Shane are hanging out one night, and he's like, I gotta go to the movie theater. Because Shane worked at the movie theater, too. That's how we met. I gotta go to the movie theater. I was like, dude, I do not want to see that girl. I don't want to see... He's like, no, no, no. And he had a cell phone. I didn't have a cell phone. Like I said, it's 2000, 2001. I think I had a pager still. Shane was one of my only friends that has cell phone, so so like um, Linda, the manager at the movie th <clears throat> movie theater, called him, and he's like, "Oh, I just got to run to the movie theater real quick." Linda's out back smoking a cigarette. I just got to talk to her. I was like, "Dude, if you are bringing me there to see this girl, I do not want to see her." No, 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 man. I promise. I promise. It's got nothing to do with that. I don't want you know. I would. I wouldn't do that to you. So, uh, so. So we're driving there, we, we pull around the back of the movie theater, and there's Linda and someone else. There was like two or three, I think there was like three people. So it's like Linda, this girl, and someone else. And they're all back there. It's snowing out. I jumped out of his Jeep, I slid down the pavement, and then I took off. Took off running. And um, and then he, uh, he eventually finds me out on the main road walking, and uh, he's like, come on, man, get in the Jeep. And I'm like, dude, what the fuck? That was a fucking asshole move. He's like, well, you know, you know, you're, uh, you know, I just want you to be able to talk to her and whatever. I was like, I don't ever want to fucking talk to her. I was so pissed, right? And unfortunately, you know, like Shane, like I said, he was my best friend at the time, and uh, I haven't talked to him in fucking 15 years, maybe, uh, maybe even more than that, maybe 16 years. Um, when we met, he had just gotten out of prison uh, for for dealing. I think he was dealing ecstasy. Um, and he did like five years in jail dealing ecstasy. And he was just a really cool guy, like post-prison. Uh, in the time that I knew him, just a really cool guy. Uh, he was funny. Uh, he was fun to hang out with. Um, he had to go to Narcotics Anon or Alcoholics Anonymous because we didn't because they didn't have like a Narcotics Anonymous around 
like part of his release from prison was that he had to do Narcotics Anonymous, but since we didn't have one, he had to go to Alcohol Anonymous. And uh, he was just such a cool guy to hang out with. And um, unfortunately, I, I tried to find him. I've tried to find him multiple times over the years. Um, in the last 10 years or so, I've tried to find him a few times to see what he's up to. And I found him once on Facebook, sent him a message, never got a reply. So just a couple months ago, uh, I am friends with his ex-girlfriend that he was dating at the time that we were best friends. Um, I am fr- friends with her on Facebook, so I messaged her. And I was like, hey, I know it's a long shot, but you know, is there any chance that you have any contact with Shane? That you, you, know, you have a phone number or something? And unfortunately, she told me this whole story about, uh, you know, basically around like 2006 or seven, he kind of really backtracked on his drugs and he started doing drugs again. He got involved in a relationship with a girl that was, you know, not helpful to that. And she did drugs too. And, and the two of them just kind of spiraled out of control. And, you know, the last she knew, um, he was living in Virginia and kind of bouncing in and out of like halfway houses and rehabs and stuff. So if you're out there, Shane, um, you know, in the in the highly unlikely event that you were to ever hear this, uh, just know that I think about you and and I miss you and and uh, hope you're okay and hope that we can catch up someday. So, uh, and this next story um, I've talked about a little bit before. In 2004, uh, I was deployed for the first time with the military, with the army, um, to Iraq to a little to a little prison camp called Camp Buka. Um, if you research, you know, the roots of ISIS, ISIS actually started at Camp Buka, so my bad, um, in about 2004, so sorry for that. Um, Camp Buka was interesting. It was huge. It was one mile by two miles, you know, one mile in length by two miles wide, or two, one mile wide by two miles in width, whatever you want to call it, one by two miles. Um, it was huge. Uh, half of the entire camp, half of that one by two, was uh, was just prisons. It was just uh, different prison pods, except it's not a prison like you think of here in America. It's not some big concrete building. Um, it's these it's these seven hundred and fifty foot by by you know two hundred foot cages, if you will. And I'm not saying that that anything that we did was inhumane. I don't think it was. We were working with what we had. Um, I do think that there was some uh, maybe morality with how some of these people ended up in there. Um, we had a list of every prisoner and what their crime was, quote unquote crime. And uh, you know, for every for every one prisoner that you saw who you know got caught launching a rocket at a at a friendly force, whether that was American or British or whoever else was over there with me at the time. In my area, it was mostly Americans and British. I think there were some people there from Poland and, and maybe a couple other. Like, I know I saw Jama- Japan there once. Um, so, but uh, but when you, you know, you look down this list for every one person that had a legit, like, okay, this person really did, you know, one person, you know, was setting up an IED or something on the side of the road. There was nine people who just had kind of a general uh, crimes against coalition forces as their reason for being locked up in there. And... At a certain point, very early on in 2004, uh, 2003, I think, very early on in 2003, they instituted a curfew in um, in Iraq of 10 p.m. It was like 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., I think. And if any Iraqi citizen was caught out between those times, they were arrested and thrown into Camp Buka with the charge of crimes against coalition forces. So... But that wasn't my choice to make. My my job there was was mostly exterior security, driving around in the in the desert, uh, making sure that no one's setting up rockets, um, you know, making sure no one's trying to escape or trying to you know facilitate an escape. Um, that was the majority of my job there. Uh, I spent some time down in the prison, which really just consisted of doing head counts and making sure that prisoners got fed on time. They got fed three times a day. During the daylight hours, they were able to walk around in these big 700, well, I mean, not big. I mean, who wants to be confined to 750 to 250 feet, um, you know, for 24 hours a day? 
seven days a week, you know, that, and there was no, it's not like there was a gym in there. They didn't get like, not, you know, their yard time really was just wake up and step outside of your tent because they were also sleeping in tents. That was the other thing. Like I said, it's not like there's this big concrete building with, with bars and stuff. It's, it's a fence. The fence was, I don't know, 50 feet high. The fence was 50 feet high with, with barbed wire on the tops. And, and then there was like 20 big tents inside of these pods like 20 of them and uh and each tent holds like 100 or 150 prisoners right so you know you're talking you know 2,000 prisoners per pod and there was about i don't know i want to say that at, at its peak there was like 10,000 prisoners in there so so um so i'm in iraq and uh you know the 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 biggest point of my of of any trauma that i saw you know, like i you know my buddy the other day posted something about losing friends. You know, he lost a couple friends on his tour in Iraq. I was fortunate in Camp Uka um, and on my second tour. Didn't lose anyone from either of my, uh, either of those tours. Um, you know, everyone that we went with came home. You know, people came home with, with, diff- with varying degrees of, of uh, injuries or trauma, if you will. But, uh, but we didn't, you know, nobody died, which is fortunate. Um, you know, I went, I, we were out one night, or we were out one morning. We started the morning, and we get an intel report. And this kid came to the came to the front gate and told us that he saw someone roaming around our our area outside of the camp, um, planting mines. He said that he saw him plant three different mines, and um, and he was able to point out two of them. Uh, and and we went out, or we didn't go out. We did go out and mark them. But we didn't go fucking with them. We just marked them, and then there was a British military explosive ordnance disposal unit um, right right outside of our camp, a couple miles outside of our camp. So we just let them know, hey, it's marked. You know, get it when you can. And and we would mark things all the time. If there was unexploded ordnance out there in the fields in the desert, then um, then we'd mark it, and and they'd come out and they'd pick it all up, and and they'd dispose of it. And usually, they by dispose of it. They'd usually just put it all in a pile in a canyon somewhere and then, you know, wrap a bunch of C4 around it and explode it. So this kid says he sees three, three, three mines get buried. They were, uh, they were anti-tank mines, old, old anti-tank mines. Um, and, uh, and we were able to find two. So there's one out there that we don't know where it is. So one day, uh, my my team was working 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. That was our shifts. It was always 12-hour shifts. For whatever reason, there was just such a workforce shortage in on, on that tour of, of like, okay, your job is 12-hour days, seven days a week. And we would alternate. Sometimes, you know, so basically like once every six weeks, we'd get 24 hours off because our shift would end at 6 p.m., you know, our 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. shift would end, and then we wouldn't have to work again until 24 hours later at the 6 p.m. shift and then work until 6 a.m. So, but um, one morning we start work. We start our little patrol. That's what we were doing. We were patrolling. We start at 6 a.m., and uh, and at like 7 or 8, um, we go to breakfast. And the way that we handled breakfast was there's six of us. There's two trucks, three three people in each truck. And uh, and the other truck, not my truck, the other truck had an interpreter in it. So, yeah, I guess there's seven of us in total. So we go to breakfast, and uh, and six people go in, and including the interpreter. And then I, uh, one of us, it might have been me, I think it was me, just stayed outside, sat at the truck, hung out, wait for everyone to come out. And those people would come out with, like, a to-go box of, of breakfast. So, um, and then, you know, I'd just eat my breakfast really quick, and then we hit the road and start driving. You know, start driving around our assigned area. So, um, so we're driving and, and, uh, there's, it rained recently. It was November 2004 and, uh, it had rained recently and we go through the, you know, it, th- there's a front truck and, and then I'm in the rear truck and the front truck goes through this big giant puddle. And then we turn into this giant puddle and, uh, just, just, I mean, just this explosion. All right. We found the third landmine. Um, just this huge explosion. And, uh, and I had a, I had a Mark 19 grenade launcher mounted on top of the truck. So I was the gunner. So I was, I'm standing, I'm, I'm standing inside the truck with half of my body outside the truck. 
and uh, and and holding on to this big giant grenade launching machine gun. It weighs 160 pounds, and it wasn't properly secured to the truck. Basically, it was mounted to the truck with its own weight. It wasn't, you know, there wasn't a pin holding it in, so it could come off freely if you could get that kind of force to push it off. And and that landmine surely sure did. Um, it pushed it off enough that this explosion happened. We came back down. You know, I was able to get my wits about me a little bit, and then I heard the machine gun hit the puddle next to me. It fell about five feet off the side of the truck into this puddle. So I looked down into the truck, and it's just all, it's black. It's a black smoke. It's just, I can't see a thing. And I thought for sure my driver and my team leader are dead. Um, I thought, you know, at the very least, my driver's dead. And uh, I'm yelling down into there, you know, George, Ken, you you guys all right? You know, I'm yelling down into there. And then the smoke starts to clear, and I can see the two of them moving around. And uh, we climb down off the truck and get a good look at the damage done to the truck. And, and the rear wheel has been blown off. And, and uh, this truck wasn't armored at all. There was no armor on it at all. It's just a regular Humvee. It's all made of, like, fiberglass, basically. Um, and uh, And a big piece of shrapnel had come through the bottom of the truck. I mean, it's about... So a piece of shrapnel, probably about the size of a football, came right through the truck and went into our, we had a water cooler. We had like a regular igloo water cooler. Went go, it went into the water cooler, which had water and ice in it. And, um, and I guess it cooled down enough when it was, you know, for that split second that it was in there that it couldn't come out the other end. But, you know, had that, had that cooler not been there, it was lined up perfectly to go right through my leg and take my leg off. So that was fortunate. I got to keep all my body parts. Um, you know, I came down, I came out of the truck and landed on my back, which, you know, still almost 20 years later, and I still deal with that pain. Um, you know, I was facing in a direction. I was looking over my left shoulder when it happened. So all of the concussive force, all of the, the noise happened right on my right, on the right side of my head. So I lost a ton of my hearing in my right ear. I think it was like sixty like percent of my hearing in my right ear, and uh, and obviously very shook up about that when it happened. So, so uh, yeah, I mean you know that that was kind of like my major Iraq thing, and um, and then uh, you know we you know we all get out of the trucks, you know take up dis- defensive positions because we don't know, you know we have no idea, we we didn't know if. There's people watching and waiting for this to happen. We didn't know that we had found the third landmine. We thought that maybe someone just set that up this morning. We have no idea what's about to happen. So, you know, we call in our QRF, and and they come out to to assist us, and they get a military tow truck out there to to bring our truck back to the back to the base and whatever. And and you know, like I said, everything worked out fine for the most part. Me and my team, we uh, went to the medical facility and got checked out and uh and I got seven days off uh because of the back pain um you know the military if you haven't been in the military they fucking tell you to drink water and have some ibuprofen and you'll be fine that's kind of their go-to for everything so but there were other instances I mean just other things that happened there like I remember one morning doing uh you know working in the prison um we had to do a count, or, or we had to wake up everyone. We did have to do it. We also had to do a count, but I had to wake up everyone one morning. Like they, had to, like the prisoners had to wake up at six in the morning. So I, uh, so they sent me in to go wake them up. Now it's just me. I'm 21 years old. I, I, you know, all I have is is not even a real baton. It's basically a fucking baseball bat. It's barely a baseball. It's not even a baseball bat. It's just a, a nightstick. You know, it's just this stick. You know. Not the black nightstick that you're used to seeing on on 1990s versions of of the show Cops, just I mean, just this long wooden stick about two inches in thickness and uh, and a little rope around the bottom of it, and um, so I go in. I'm waking everyone up, and this one prisoner just won't get out. Won't get up. He won't get out of bed. And I keep you know telling him, you know, I can tell you, I never fucking hit anyone with the stick. I mean, fuck, we had a riot inside the prison once. Where you know I could have been shooting people with with less than lethal rounds, and I didn't do that either. And uh, and really, it had a lot to do with all the controversy in the media over Abu Ghraib at the time. 
because um, when I was asked later, why didn't you shoot these people? I was like, are you kidding me? Have you seen the news? I'm not fucking going to be on CNN tonight. So, uh, so, um, so yeah, this guy, I'm, I'm trying to wake him up. I'm taking this baton and I'm pounding it on the wooden floor to, you know, say, Hey man, come on, let's go. And all of a sudden this guy jumps up like a UFC fighter and gets right in my face. And it's just me. I'm inside of this tent and it's me and 150 Iraqi prisoners who are waiting for one of us to make a move, me or this guy. What? And, and really it's not going to end well either way. If I make a move, they're all going to, they're all jumping on me. If he makes a move, they're going to join their buddy. Um, so he jumps up, he gets right in my face. Not an especially tall guy or anything like that. He's a couple inches shorter than me, I think, if I remember right. He's maybe a few inches shorter than me. Kind of scrawny, like you'd expect. Um, you know, someone who's uh, forced to only eat three times a day and lives in 120 degrees all year round and doesn't give a fuck about it. Um, but, you know, scary nonetheless. Especially when, you know, he's got 150 friends around him. You know, if this were different, if it was just me and him on the outside of that fence and I have 150 military people with me, of course, yeah, I'm going to feel pretty goddamn safe. And I'm inside of a tent, you know, and I don't have a radio. It's not like I can be like, hey, can I get some backup in here? No, I have no radio. Uh, you know, there's there's watchtowers, but they can't see inside the tent. All that they can do, really, is just wait for me to come out the other side. You know, you walk in one end, and you walk down the little alleyway, and you walk out the other end, and that's really all they can do. And if I don't come out in five minutes, maybe they'll be like, hey, uh, whatever happened to him? Maybe they wouldn't even fucking know. Um, so, luckily, that one, it all worked out fine, that one. Um, you know, eventually, he just kind of backed down and let me pass and, and walk through the rest of the way. And, uh, and I continued my, my job. I went through the rest of the tents, waking people up and, and that was it, um, for that one. And then there was, you know, there was rockets. I mean, we would be standing there some nights and we'd hear mortars come in, you know, they weren't especially good at aiming them, which honestly I wouldn't be either. You know, all I know that all I know about a mortar system is that you, you set it up and you hope for the, you know, for me, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to set it up and hope for the best. I'm going to drop the mortar in there and duck my head down and, and shoot this thing off and hope that I aimed it correctly. And, you know, maybe I'd have the knowledge to say, okay, I missed my target by however many degrees. I'm going to adjust target and adjust fire and, and try again. Um, so, I mean, you know, the mortars that came in, they never really hit anything important. And uh, there was one night we were sitting there and we heard a rocket go flying right over our heads and then explode out in the dark, uh, out in the desert. Gunshots. I mean, gunshots all the fucking time. Um, you know, taking shots at trucks. You know, the trucks that we used to go to go to uh, Baghdad. Those trucks were armored. So, you know, taking shots at trucks. And and then you know, I came home and I didn't think anything of it. I, I you know I came home and I heard stories from Vietnam guys and I was like, oh yeah, you you guys got fucked up. I didn't think anything of it. And then um, and then I went on my second tour. And, and that really just, you know, I, I remember I called my dad one day. I was going through some really bad times. And, uh, you know, my ex-wife, she left. And uh, I really hated my job. Um, I was working for a police department that I didn't like. And uh, I just was not happy. And, and I could, you know, for whatever fucking stupid-ass reason in my head, I came up with um, whatever I came up with. Was if I, you know, the last, you know, if I go back to Iraq. So it's been, at this time, it's been like six years. Six, yeah, yeah, I re-enlisted in 2010. So at this time, I've been home for five years. I had been home for five years, and I thought, you know what? If I go back to Iraq, maybe I can undo all of this bad. Maybe I can, maybe I can switch everything back. Maybe I can go back over, and when I come back home, everything will be fine, right? That's kind of, you know, my 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 thing is running away from problems and just hoping that they fix themselves. And, uh, so I, and, you know, I thought that if I reenlist, I'll, I'll go back overseas and everything will be fine when I come home. And of course it wasn't. And of course I go back over there and things are still fucked up. It's still a war torn country. I'm still getting shot at. We, we got shot at on our second tour. We're driving at night. We have no idea what's in front of us. There were units that hit IEDs and EFPs and all sorts of bullshit. Right. So, I mean, they didn't want us there. So who can blame them? You know, I, I always thought that. 
if there were any ever if the if the roles were ever reversed and a country invaded America, I always thought I would make a damn good insurgent. You know, I, I feel like, you know, I, I'd be able to figure out, you know, if this is the enemy, if this is the person, you know, if Russia decided to take over America and they're setting up bases everywhere and they're doing missions driving up I-95, you know, I always thought that, you know, I'd be figuring out ways to, to just fuck up their operation. So well, the second tour agitated all of those things from the first tour. And so that didn't work out. So then I came home and I was, uh, I was, um, you know, I, I started going to counseling right away. I mean, and that happened before I even, you know, that was pretty much set in place because I talked to a counselor while I was overseas and he was like, we need to continue talking when we get home. Um, cause he saw all the signs on the wall and, uh, and I didn't, I, I was, you know, the first time that he told me that he thought that I had PTSD, um, I, uh, the first time he told me that I, I that he, that I had PTSD, I was like, no, I don't. Um, I had, uh, so I'd heard stories of people. And her stories, and I was like, that's not possible. <sighs> Give me one second. Give me just a second. <laughs> so, I was, yeah, I was like, that's not possible. I, how could I, you know, that's... I didn't go through the things that <laughs> oh, God damn it. I didn't mean for any of this shit to happen. Um and I didn't go through all the shit that other people went through. I didn't lose anyone. I wasn't engaged in fire fights or anything like that. Like, I didn't go through that stuff, so. So. So it didn't make sense to me. And then we talked some more and, you know, like I said. I guess it started to make sense to me. So, it started to make more sense to me. So, anyways, those were my two, my two deployments. And then, uh, you know, obviously there was that first deployment. And then that was in 2004 to 2004. And then in 2010 and 2011. And in between those two is when uh, is when my mother was killed by a drunk driver. So that was in 2006. And, uh, and you know, I was talking to my dad the other day, a couple of weeks ago now. And he says to me, something very unique happened to our family. And I didn't say it to him. I didn't, I didn't bother him. I didn't bother correcting him on this. But what I thought in my head immediately was, it's not that unique. My mother getting killed by a drunk driver is not that unique. It happens to 50,000 plus people every year. 50,000 plus DWI fatalities every year. That number outweighs firearm deaths, you know. And I mean, if you account for suicides, there's only, that you know, Suicides account for about 20,000 of 30,000 fire, firearms deaths, right? So so discount the suicides, right? So that's that's now you're down to 10,000 deaths by firearms per year. I mean, 50,000 plus dwarfs the number of, of, of people killed in mass shootings. You know, that, that only happens to about three or 400 people. My mother was killed at Pulse nightclub. 
or if she was killed in Las Vegas, or if she was killed at Sandy Hook, then that would be a unique way to lose uh, your mother or your spouse. But to say something unique happened to us is just not true. It happens all the time. And and where I wanted to go was with all of the what I'm saying tonight, today, is trauma is a weird fucking thing. <laughs> Trauma can, you can use it as a crutch if you want to. You can use it as a crutch. You know, if, if I cut my hand right now, my body is going to go to work right away. My body's going to go to work right away fixing that cut. I could drag a knife down my hand right now, and my body will just immediately start going to work on stopping the bleeding Stopping the bleeding and and fixing this cut. With trauma, it's more of a conscious decision to to address it and 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 not let it be a crutch. You know, it's very easy to say, I I, I hate my job and I can't get a new job because because this happened to me. Because, you know, this thing happened to me. That's bullshit. That's total bullshit. You're making a choice to not make your life better, to not pursue happiness. You know, we live in a great country where we have the the pursuit of happiness is is embedded in our genes. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to go out and and do the things that you want. If you're going to sit here and tell me that you haven't made the money that you want to, that's that's your pro- that's something that you are consciously deciding not to do. You can't tell me that you hate your job because your boss is an asshole, but you don't want to leave. You've been telling saying that you you hate this job for four years, five years, 10 years, however long, and you're still there. You didn't do anything to go and fix it. You didn't do anything. And you could use it as a crutch that you, well, I have this trauma that's preventing me. No, it's not. There's no such thing as trauma that is preventing you from doing anything. You can get whatever trauma you have ever experienced addressed. You can go, you can, you can fix it yourself. You don't have to rely on that but it's much easier to have that cut on your hand and walk around showing to people and say oh my god look at this cut on my hand and what if you get that cut fixed what if you do throw a towel on it and you stop the bleeding and you let your body fix that cut then you don't have that thing anymore to show people people aren't there anymore to say oh my god i'm so sorry about your hand but if you have that trauma in you if your mother has been killed by a drunk driver or you went over a landmine or your buddy was killed in iraq or whatever it is that your problem is Whatever you think is holding you back from your own fucking happiness, you don't have the opportunity to go and just show it to people to say, look at me, please look at me and please feel bad for me. Why, why would I don't I don't I don't want that to be me ever. I would never let my trauma guide me around my life. Whatever decisions I've made in life, whatever things I've said or done, whatever feelings I've hurt or people I've offended, I would never say I did those things because of something that happened to me in the past. I've offended plenty of people just in the last year or two or three. I mean, this show is... is a stream of consciousness. It's just me talking and unloading my thoughts, my own thoughts. You know, I used to journal on both of my tours in Iraq. I used to keep a journal, but I was very bad at keeping that journal. I would write in it maybe once a week, and sometimes I might even go a month or six weeks between putting something in there. And I really enjoyed it. I liked writing something down. I liked writing something down to say, this is what I'm doing today. These are the missions that I'm going on today. These are the things that I saw today. These are the things that I've seen in the last few weeks. I really enjoyed that, but I was really bad at it, at keeping a consistent schedule of doing it because I think I set my bar a little too high. My bar was to do it every day, and I think I started with every day. And then it kind of just faded off. And and, and then a couple, you know, once, you you know, for me, every time that I've said I'm going to do something every day, with the exception of the gym the last two or three months, every time that I've said I'm going to do something every day, I'm able to keep that schedule for a few days, and then once one day goes by, then it's, well, I don't know, maybe maybe the next day, maybe the day after, maybe, you know, and I put days and days and days between these things until I finally do it. This show keeps me on a, a schedule, you know, I, I just have to sit here 
once a week and, and, and try and make it happen. And I try to be good about making it happen. I try to be good about, you know, getting an episode out every week. And, and, and like I said, it's just a stream of consciousness. I don't necessarily do it because I want to make people laugh or because I want to make people like me or because, you know, I want to be an asshole. I do it because I want to be able to record my own thoughts and put my own thoughts out there. I try to add something that someone might hear and, and relate to, something that someone might might say, oh, yeah, that's me too. You know, if, if I talk about COVID or I talk about the president or I talk about, you know, my time overseas or whatever, maybe someone will hear that stuff and relate to it. But But it's really just for me. The show has always just been something for me and yeah I mean I don't, I don't yeah I just try to do something that I can record and have my own thoughts out there and and uh you know people can know what I'm thinking and I mean can you say that about yourself if you're not like me if you're not one of my fellow podcasters <laughs> who who um who does this by themselves and and just tries to you know talk about whatever they want to talk about if you're not one of those people can you say that about yourself can you say like everything that i think i've ever said that has um you know offended someone hurt feelings whatever all those things that i've ever said um i knew would get back to them i'm not i'm not neurodecelerated I knew these things would get back to those people, whoever they were. You know, there have been a handful of people. And, you know, there's a, there, I think it's a, I think it's called a metaphor. I think it's a metaphor of like, a, of an orange where, you know, if I take an orange and I put it in the palm of my hand and I squeeze that orange with all of my might, I squeeze it and what comes out? Orange juice. Orange juice comes out of the orange. And why? Well, that's but that's because that's what's inside of it. And all the times that I've said something on the show that might have offended someone, that someone is an orange, and I, and 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 I am the one squeezing them, and they're angry and offended because I've exposed something that was inside of them, and and they they didn't like that coming out. They didn't like seeing it. So, what's inside of you? What's, what are you holding back that you're not talking to people about? What are you not saying? What, what have, is it, I'm sorry, I've offended people by speaking my mind. (laughs) My father described it as me sitting in a field throwing stones. It's not really sitting in a field throwing stones because I know that people will hear this stuff. I know it will get back to them. I know Whatever I say is not just me keeping it inside my head, which I think is more than most people can say. My father also told me when I was a kid, be careful of anyone that would talk shit about you behind your back. Or I'm sorry, be careful of anyone that would talk shit about someone else to you because what is that person saying when when they're with another person? I'm not, I don't think anyone is perfect at that. I think everyone probably says things about other people, about their friends, about their family, about their loved ones, says things that they wouldn't say to that person's face, but they're, they're happy to say it to another person. They don't mind saying it to another person at all. Uh, my friend PH uh, posted a picture not long ago, a week or two ago, that said, um, something to the effect of what you know don't tell me what the person said about me tell me why they felt comfortable saying it to you at all something to that effect I just talked to a camera and a microphone and in some cases you know in some cases I'm, I'm you know blindly saying things that I'm like oh, you know I don't think anything of this in other cases, I'm saying things that I'm like, I know this is going to get back to the person I'm talking about, and I don't mind because I, you know, whatever, call it what you will. I don't have the balls to go say it to their own face. 
fine if that's what you want to say. But, you know, I know it'll get back to them. So, <sighs> how long have I been going out this far? 45 minutes. I think that's enough time for me tonight. I think, uh, I think I managed to, um, do a completely not funny episode. Um, zero jokes. Um, I just want to touch on, on it again before I wrap it up is that trauma doesn't define you no matter what your past is. I don't care what it is, whatever you went through. I am sure it sucks, whatever it was. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you were sexually assaulted as a kid. It doesn't matter if you lost your parent in an extremely violent way. It doesn't matter if your friend blew his brains out in front of your face. Trauma doesn't define a person. Okay, a person that defines a person. All right, you can live your own life the way that you want. Don't fucking, you know, complain about traffic. Get a, Find a different way to go home. Explore the, explore the unbeaten path. Um, you know, complaining about your job, find a new job. Don't like your coworkers, find a new job. Don't like your family, don't go to family events. Don't like, don't like what's on TV. Turn off the fucking TV. Stop complaining. If you have a complaint about something, there's nothing that forces you to deal with it. Hobbies too expensive. Find a new hobby. It's not as expensive. There's a solution to all of these things. But don't let trauma fucking define who you are when you can be a better person. Because I don't. I know that I can be a better person. I know that I've been a better person in the past year. And I continue to, you know, find new ways to keep becoming a better person. And I don't mind it at all. I like I like me. I'm, I'm not upset about where I'm at in life right now at all. I'm doing just fine. So, all right. That's it for me. Thanks for listening to a completely unfunny episode. And I will talk to you guys next week.